for the first time in history, we've got an early first minister. Uh, first minister, <laughs> you're, you're uh, very welcome to this meeting of the conveners group. This is, of course, the first time ever since the Parliament was formed in 1999 that we've had a first minister before us uh, prepared to answer questions um, of the, all of the conveners of the Parliament. It's, uh, as part of our wider reform agenda of holding uh, the government to account. So, First Minister, is there anything you'd like to say at this point? Well, I'll be, uh, I'll be very brief, uh, Presiding Officer, but <clears throat> it is a, a historic occasion which should be marked. Uh, I congratulate the committee conveners and yourself, of course, for uh, bringing this into being. Uh, I think we should have done it some time ago, but uh, so it's a historic occasion. Very briefly, I was struck and that during the Cabinet and the Scottish Minister's uh, uh, summer cabinets where we go around the country, just how effective uh, that process is in terms of public engagement. And of course, I, I note that the parliamentary committees also go uh, uh, around, uh, around the country, and I, I think that's uh, an extremely effective means of the parliament communicating to the people. Uh, secondly, the, uh, regardless of you know, individual government party, uh, there is no doubt that in 14 years, the the Scottish Parliament has established itself as preeminent in the, the trust that the people place in it. Uh, the figures are overwhelming. Uh, uh, when any survey or attitude survey or opinion poll asks who do you trust to operate in the best interest of the people of Scotland, then the Scottish Parliament is now preeminent, and that is no inconsiderable achievement. And I suspect the interreaction of the committee system with the people has been an important part of that. Uh, and thirdly, in terms of the, the government's programme, then obviously the key priorities are, are what I set out last week and what John Swinney set out yesterday. The pri priorities are to accelerate recovery, to create jobs, to make Scotland a, a fairer place, to empower communities, and of course, by necessity at the present moment, tackling where we can some of the, the impact of uh, policies directed from elsewhere, particularly in the welfare changes which are, are bearing down on so many of our communities. Uh, so that's the onus of the government's programme. I look forward to, to being as helpful as I possibly can to, to every committee convener. And I know there's a lot of committee conveners, and we have, by necessity, a limited time. So I'll draw my remarks to a close and, and put myself in your good hands, presenting officer. Thank you. Um, I'm tempted to say that's the first time for the brief first minister as well. Uh, but you, you're, abs you're absolutely right. Um, time is very, very limited. Um, I think every convener here has indicated they want to speak about their own area of choice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with Kenneth Gibson, who is the chair of the Finance Committee. Now, if any other convener wants to come in with supplementary questions on the themes that Mr Gibson has been developing, then indicate to me. Um, but that will not stop you coming in later on um, on your, your, your own um, stream. So, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and good afternoon, First uh, Minister. Um, just, um, you will be aware that the Finance Committee is uh, taking the lead in scrutinising the legislation um, and financial powers which are coming out as a result of the 2012 uh, Scotland Act. We've already completed the land buildings and transaction tax. Uh, we're now scrutinising the, the landfill tax and we look forward to the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill which we will be looking at uh, from November onwards. However, the committee has expressed uh, some uh, concerns at the lack of clarity regarding the respective roles of Revenue Scotland and Registers of Scotland in administering the Land Buildings Transaction Tax, and also uh, Revenue Scotland and SEPA in administering the Landfill Tax. So I'm just wondering if you con are confident that the administrative arrangements will be ready in good time to ensure a smooth transition of the devolved taxes and that all interested parties will be fully uh, apprised of all the new arrangements? Oh, yes, I am uh, confident of that, Kenny, not least of which I expect your committee to be uh, placing Mr Swinney and his colleagues under, uh, uh, under officials, under uh, convincing examination to, to make sure that's the case. I mean, the, the setting up Revenue Scotland is a historic step. I mean, that's, uh, we, we've not had that in Scotland for well, over 300 years in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of a, a revenue c collecting body, the introduction of new taxes. I think at this stage the, the most encouraging thing is uh, in terms of the estimates and the robust estimates put forward in terms of the cost of collection, uh, then the setting up and establishment of Revenue Scotland uh, is going to do the job of administering these new taxes considerably more efficiently than the, the alternative offer from HMRC. 
so that is a, a, a good confidence start to make, but I'm sure your committee will be closely examining the relative roles of uh, Revenue Scotland in terms of the breakdown of responsibilities to make sure it's successful. That's part of the, the, the parliamentary process. Yes, indeed, and uh, I have to say to you that Mr Swinney will certainly confirm that he does get a fairly robust grilling when he comes forward to our committee, and that won't uh, change in the months ahead. Uh, given the time constraints and the number of other people that are obviously here, I'm just wondering if I can ask you one other question, which is a, a really important issue as we go forward, and that's uh, with regard to the adjustment of the block grant in relation to the Scottish rate of income tax and other devolved taxes. And I'm just wondering if you can perhaps provide us with an update of where we are. Uh, we have certainly some concerns on the committee uh, about the rate of progress. Well, it's a very important issue because, as we know, when this issue was discussed uh, in some detail, that there is a, a vulnerability in terms of relying on projections and, uh, and outruns. And it could be, unless these matters are, are carefully considered, we could get a, a, an effective deflationary squeeze on Scottish finances. Uh, the, uh, the progress is not at a level where we can be completely satisfied. And uh, I'm sure, Mr Swinney, there has been progress. But uh, we have to make sure we are not reliant in terms of the Parliament's finances, not on what is collected in Scotland, because that is by, by reference a, a, a fair thing to do, uh, but on the forecast of what might have been collected in Scotland, which may or may not. Touch. So there has to be a, a copper bottom method in that calculation of making sure we are not uh, vulnerable uh, to uh, revisions in, uh, in Treasury forecasts. Uh, as you know, uh, the Treasury forecasts uh, are often revised. Thank you, McNeil. Uh, Convener of Health and Support Committee. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I would like to, uh, you know, I think it's all new to us here today in terms of the scope, um, and, and, and hopefully I can keep myself in your good favours, President Officer. But I would like to ask maybe a couple of questions. One, uh, in, in general, uh, 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 about the programme for government and one specifically um, uh, about we, what may be included ongoing in the programme for government. Uh, you made reference, First Minister, quite rightly, and I've spoken powerfully in the past uh, about alienation uh, and the inequalities that, that have bedeviled us here uh, in Scotland for some considerable time, uh, where well-meaning uh, initiatives across governments have been attempted, and sadly, uh, we uh, haven't uh, cracked that nut. And the, the committee uh, have uh, an inquiry and uh, ongoing and themes ongoing to try and bring out some of the issues there. In your discussions for the programme of government, did did you evaluate the overall programme in terms of whether this would reduce inequalities, reduce the gap between rich and poor, whether the, the, the programme for government would broadly have no impact or improve the impact? Well, <clears throat> I, I thought for a second, Duncan, you were going to say you were trying to get to my good offices. And so I, was, <laughs> I, was quite, I, was quite I will continue to, be, to try, First Minister. It, it turned out to be the... Uh, turn about to the presiding officer. Uh, we do a quality assess uh, our, both our programme and individual bills, and as you know, one of the, the targets uh, in terms of social cohesion that the government has that we are matched against is to, to do what we can to increase social cohesion across uh, Scottish society. Uh, we have to be aware uh, that many of the immediate overwhelming instruments uh, that uh, can immediately impact on relative family incomes are not under our control. Uh, for example, we don't control the minimum wage, uh, but of course we do control the living wage in terms of uh, the public sector, uh, the government public sector in Scotland. Uh, we don't control the, the welfare system, but we're trying, uh, as you know in this programme, to, to bring forward uh, what we can do to mitigate the, the, the impact of uh, these welfare changes. So we, we look at our programme in terms of uh, social cohesion in Scottish uh, uh, society, aware that we don't have uh, perhaps the commanding heights uh, under our control, but the policies we do have under our control are still very, very important. Now, in terms of long-term change, then, as you know, the early intervention funding uh, is one of our key 
levers and uh, initiatives uh, in terms of the long-term changes in Scottish society. We believe the earlier we intervene, the better, and across a range of policies that uh, uh, that fund and that money will come, come into being, and I'm sure its application will be closely examined by your committee. The reason I ask that question, uh, First Minister, I think uh, during the course of our inquiry, evidence from previous Cabinet Secretary and indeed current Cabinet Secretary and uh, Sir Harry Burns, the Chief Medical Officer, are pointing to that wide range of interventions, not simply income, uh, but how we can change people's circumstances. The only portfolio that makes the reduction of health inequalities an absolute target and they're tested on is health. And the question arises, given the importance of jobs, education and all of the other portfolios, why isn't it in those portfolios that their top priority should be reducing inequalities in that portfolio? The, the, the government, uh, Duncan, has a, a social cohesion priority uh, at the heart of our aims uh, of government. It, it's understandable, and far as health inequalities are concerned, and the, it's the, uh, the health portfolio that, uh, that has that, as you put it, as its uh, top uh, priority, or one of its top priorities, and rightly so, because the, the health inequalities are, to some extent, a manifestation of underlying economic uh, inequality. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, you know, I would submit that in terms of... Uh, what's under the government's province, then we're doing exactly the right thing by having that as a priority in health, but also having our overarching uh, aim of social cohesion throughout, uh, throughout Scotland. I don't know where we're going to make some, much progress on that one, but I think the evidence does show that we need to do more in some of these other priorities to recognise that inequality can be tackled in the remits and the powers that we've got in education, educational attainment, access to appropriate education, right across the justice system, there are big issues there. And I, 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 I'm uncertain about whether a, a quality measurement provides the, the, the proper focus. But I, I, I have no doubt that this government are just as serious as previous governments are trying to do it, but I think there's more needs to be done. Because of the, construction, the, the constraints of time, just moving quickly in to another one, hopefully there's some consensus in that as well. Minimum pricing, unfortunately, is stalled in the courts. Um, we we recognise that it wasn't simply a silver bullet, that other things could be done, which were in a competition, maybe should be done. Um, my colleague Richard Simpson uh, uh, has outlined a, a number of sensible uh, measures that have gained support across the parties, the opposition parties, and I'm just, um, you know, take the opportunity now uh, to, to put it to the First Minister that there may be room in that uh, programme for government, that legislative programme, to take on these eminently sensible uh, uh, proposals by Richard Simmons and, and a private member as well, and hopefully the Minister can, uh, First Minister can give us some assurances that it will give it fair wind. Well, I mean, I welcome the fact, Duncan, that uh, <clears throat> minimum pricing for alcohol has, uh, uh, has much more uh, support across the Parliament than perhaps it did in the, uh, in, in the last Parliament, because I think it's helpful when the Parliament moves forward with a, a, a common uh, agenda, not least of which when you're battling it through, uh, uh, through the courts to get it established. But I wouldn't want it said, and let me say, we'll look at any constructive suggestions in terms of policy initiatives. And, of course, from a very high and disturbing level, there are some welcome trends in the consumption of alcohol in Scotland, which have developed over the, the last few years. Reductions, the first serious reductions we've seen for a, a long time. But I wouldn't want it thought that minimum pricing for alcohol is the only... Uh, the only area of government initiative in, in these matters, and, and I know that you're aware it's not. I mean, for example, in the licensing bill, uh, we're toughening the uh, uh, laws in terms of sale of alcohol to, to people who are uh, underage. For example, the, the legislation uh, on terms of uh, outlawing bulk discounts uh, in terms of alcohol sales is pointed to by many people as being one of the initial successes, which shows that price determines consumption uh, to a great extent. But let me assure you, uh, we'll look at any positive suggestions. If there are positive suggestions, either in legislation or in proposals that, that come forward that can be adopted into the, uh, the government's policies and programmes, uh, uh, then we'll, <laughs> we'll, uh, we don't look at the, uh, uh, the background and the origins of good ideas. If they're good ideas, then uh, <laughs> we'll take them on board, Duncan. Stuart Maxwell, Convener, Education Culture Committee. Oh, thank you very much. Officer. Um, good afternoon, First Minister. Um, one of the um, 
interesting things about the document you published in Empowering Scotland, the Government's Programme for Scotland 2013-14, was on the ambitions within the Early Years Collaborative section of the document. And I wondered if um, you could maybe expand on the issue of, of childcare in particular. I mean, it repeatedly comes up in Parliament, in the Chamber, at committee, obviously. FMQs, it regularly comes up as well. What is the government's reasoning? What's the under, underlying logic for the government's priorities in what's been set out in the document in terms of under five childcare? Why have you chosen these particular methods? Well, we want to make a, a success of, of delivering with local authorities in Scotland in partnership uh, a huge enhancement of uh, nursery and childcare provision in Scotland, and that's the, the move to, to 600 hours from 412 in, uh, in 2007. That has a substantial effect and benefit for, for children and families uh, in Scotland. We're talking, I think, about 121,000 children will benefit. And I think the, the average, if you put it into cost terms, the benefit per child is £700. Uh, so this is a very, very substantial change for the better uh, in Scottish society. Now, in doing that, in partnership with local authorities and in committing the funds to, to raise to 600 hours, as Mr Swinney did yesterday in his budget, I mean, we're talking very substantial amounts of public money. I think it's 190 million over the, over the next two years. And we have to be absolutely certain that the quality childcare provision is in place, that the, uh, it's not just the, the demand, but the supply uh, is in place in order to make a success of, of these initiatives. So. Uh, that is, we are confident that will happen. Our local authority partners are confident it will happen. And sometimes, you know, when we get the uh, the debates uh, in the chamber, uh, the uh, and I get told of things which are happening elsewhere. I mean, I, I look at what's happening elsewhere and find there are huge controversies about whether adequate uh, resources and places are available. I, I think you know, it's very important for us to concentrate on delivering this in terms of looked after two-year-olds looking at the most vulnerable two-year-olds, I think the initiative is obvious. In terms of other issues that we bring forward, the family nurse partnerships, uh, I know that you, your committee will be very familiar with, uh, with, with that initiative being rolled out across Scotland and the benefits it can have. And in terms of how this comes into the, uh, the early intervention and, uh, and change funds, is, is really important. These are not one-off uh, initiatives, they're part of a, a pattern uh, to both support the development of children at the earliest stage possible, uh, but also, of course, to enable uh, uh, parents, particularly women, uh, to re-enter the workforce uh, and to be able to afford to re-enter the workforce, because we think that will confer substantial economic benefits. The issue of re-entering the workforce and employability for uh, women in particular. We had two parents at committee this week who raised this very issue, uh, and while welcoming the increase in hours, uh, it raised two separate points. One was the fact that uh, if local authorities deliver this on the basis of two and a half hours per day, then that does not help them um, in getting into the workforce because clearly they wanted the flexibility, for example, to take all of the hours spread across two or three days or two and a half days. That allowed them to take part-time work um, rather than you know, two and a half hours a day because that was uh, uh, ridiculously inflexible, was their view. And secondly, I think the issue they, they wanted also me to raise with you, I think, and in, in the Parliament in general, was the issue of what happens effectively when children go to school? What about after school care? Because one of the problems they said they found was that even though the children were in school for some of the hours, one of the problems with taking full-time employment was the lack of after school care. Well, we were asked uh, initially, why, why are you moving forward with legislation in this area as opposed to just increasing the hours? Uh, now, one of the, the, the key reasons for that is we know that the questions of flexibility and how these, the hours entitlement it delivered can be almost as important as the number of hours itself for the very reason that uh, that, that you've explained. That's why we're, we're moving forward legislation. As you know, we have a, a group which has input from uh, across the parties. Malcolm Chisholm's a, a member of the Year's Task Force is giving advice, and that was one of their early parts of advice reflecting what uh, uh, the families before your committee had to say. So the importance of this legislation is to place on a statutory footing, which is very important, of course, in itself, but also to have a different style and flexibility of delivery. Uh, and hopefully, while I'm, I don't expect it will meet, because uh, you know, these are substantial but still incremental changes for the better. It won't meet every aspiration, but nonetheless, most people, I think, will regard it as an improvement. But it's critical as we expand the hours, we secure the quality and also introduce the flexibility to have the best early results. Michael McMahon. 
convener of the Welfare Reform Committee. Thank you, President Officer. Um, First Minister, there has been general acceptance that the Scottish Government can't mitigate all of the impact of the draconian welfare reforms that are coming from Westminster. And equally, there has been a, a general acceptance uh, that what the Scottish Government has done has to be welcomed. Um, the, 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 um, the legislation that you brought forward and the funding that has been made available, uh, while well, there might have been a debate about whether the levels of that funding could have been more or less, there, there's certainly widespread acceptance that you've done a lot to uh, address the, the damage that's, that's going to come uh, in the years ahead. One of the things that you've done is the Scottish Welfare Fund, um, but there has been, a, a, again, a widespread disappointment at the take-up of the, the Scottish Welfare Fund. And there's not a lot of evidence yet as to the, the levels. Uh, we know that it's bedding in. We're trying to get to the bottom of that. So I've got a sort of two-part um, question to you. Will you, because the, the, the Welfare Reform Committee has taken on a budget advisor this year to look specifically at the, the council tax reduction um, element of the budget and also the Scottish Welfare Fund, and we are going to be legislating on that uh, in your programme, will we have access to the information on the Scottish Welfare Fund as it becomes available, because we need that now? And, and secondly, in terms of the, the take-up, do you think that there was adequate or sufficient uh, public awareness raising of the availability of the Scottish Welfare Fund? Because it appears that part of the problem, this is anecdotal so far, is that the, the DWP was known to have been responsible for crisis loans and, and the, the other supports. But having transferred that to local government, the advice and information to allow people to access that hasn't been forthcoming. Do you think we've been remiss in uh, informing people of where they can access the support that's available, and that has been part of the reason why the take-up has been so low. Michael, I mean, first of all, let me acknowledge the, the way that you've asked the question, because I, I think it's very helpful. I mean, the, the, the total government funding, I think, over the next three years, in terms of the mitigation efforts, uh, I think is reaching something like £224 million. Pounds. Okay, a committee from, uh, that's our, our total spending now. That is only a, a portion of the estimates of income withdrawal, uh, but nonetheless, it's a very, very substantial part of, of Scottish Government funding now. Uh, the second thing I would say is that I, I follow your committee <laughs> proceedings very carefully, Michael, and I sort of anticipated the, 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 the direction that you might be coming from, and rightly so. And I'm able to say, and I hope this is helpful, that in November we'll be able to give you the first robust figures of the welfare fund in its first six months of, of operation, and they'll be, we believe, robust and reliable. In terms of what has and hasn't been done in terms of the welfare fund, uh, and I'll, I'll draw a contrast here with the council tax reduction scheme, incidentally. Uh, the council tax reduction scheme, if you remember, there was a debate as to whether we could do this in terms of legislative competence. Indeed, if I remember correctly, the, 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 some legal advice the, was that to the contrary uh, that the committee had. But we, we pushed ahead and we realised with our local authority partners, if it was done as a reduction as opposed to a benefit, then it was within competence. And because we were able to do that, we've had a virtual full uh, take-up and effectiveness of helping you know, almost 500,000, I think, families in terms of not suffering the, the, council tax, uh, the council tax impact that otherwise they would have had. The Welfare Fund, of course, administered by local authorities, a new fund brought into being, I, I think inevitably it's going to be more difficult than a, a tried and tested method of, of funding. Uh, now, the figures that we're able to present to you in November will give us the, the uh, robust, for your committee, a robust estimate of what's happening. And, of course, I expect your committee to, to look at that and see what improvements could be made, because everybody, it's in everybody's interest to make sure it's working effectively. And if I, if I was just to make an estimate for Michael, I don't think, you know, if we're having this discussion in the regular meetings that we have, that we're going to think that the welfare fund is undersubscribed uh, as it comes into operation. Uh, I think if we evaluate on the one size the, the scale of the, the pressure on people, the pressure on families, and the availability of funds, I don't think undersubscription is going to be a long-term problem with this fund. But let the figures come out in November. We'll have a robust examination. And if the committee can see and identify improvements to assist and take up, then of course the, the, the government and I'm sure our local authority partners will want to listen. 
One of the, the points that's been raised with me, First Minister, has been that, and it's inevitable this is going to be the case, that you're going to spend a lot of money in public awareness of your white paper on independence. You're going to spend a lot of money on promoting your cause. And when it comes to that, it would reflect badly if the take-up of the Scottish Welfare Fund uh, dropped because there wasn't a parallel or at least equivalent um, commitment to publicising and making aware to the, the, those who could benefit from the Scottish Welfare Fund that that fund is available to them? Well, I, I, I don't think you should necessarily anticipate that any shortage of take-up is going to be a, a long-term problem with this fund. I think it's far more to do, as you suggested in your first question, with the fact it's a, a new innovation of necessity. I mean, I think we both agreed we'd rather have a, a welfare fund than not have a welfare fund. And I think we both agreed the local authorities were the right people because of their responsibilities in terms of housing benefit and council tax benefit, the right people to, to, to be administering uh, uh, the fund. Uh, I think, hopefully, the committee also agree that putting it in a statutory footing in the legislative programme is an indication of the, the level and seriousness with which we take this initiative and take our responsibilities to do our best, as you put it, to mitigate. We can't wipe away. We can't eliminate. We don't have the budget or the responsibility for, to be able to do that, but we can mitigate. And the fact it's in the legislative programme is a, underlies the seriousness, underlines the seriousness of which we take our responsibilities in this matter. One more short question, uh, President Officer. I don't believe that there's anything legally that would prevent the, the Scottish Parliament from looking at changing the Housing Act to address problems with the bedroom tax. There may be technical reasons, there may be reasons to not go down that route because the legislation that's proposed is not considered to be the vehicle uh, that will address the problem. But will you commit today to ensuring that any uh, legislation that's brought forward by uh, individual members is given proper consideration, um, because it's clearly a housing issue, and we have responsibility for that here, and we could look at um, the Housing Act to see if we can address the problems that are being affected, the individuals who are being affected by the bedroom tax. Well, Michael, the, if we remember the debate about the council tax, uh, there was great scepticism that the method that we uh, chose and put forward uh, to face the issue was robust and legal, but we said it was, and I think we've been vindicated by uh, uh, events. If I remember correctly, there was a number of votes uh, uh, on this very matter. Uh, we know and believe that the, the mechanism which was proposed to us by Shelter in terms of discretionary housing payments to try and help with the impact of the, the bedroom tax, we know that's robust and legal and falls within the limit of one and a half times. Uh, we don't have an assurance that there is uh, uh, another legal route. So we've got two restrictions. One is a, a legality and competence. And the second, of course, is the available budget, both of which bear down, as you acknowledged in your first question. But nonetheless... Uh, again, as I've as said to your colleague, if ideas come forward which enable us uh, with bu you know, a budgetary provision uh, and within competence to do something effective to help the people of Scotland, then that's what the, uh, the, the government's about. And uh, we'll look at the quality of the idea, not the, the origin of the suggestion. Bob Gibson, uh, Convener of Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, in what ways will the new uh, Common Agriculture Policy deal that was struck by the UK Government, which leaves Scotland's rural economy with the lowest support in Europe, hinder Scotland's highly successful food and drink industry from building on record targets that have been announced this week and in creating new jobs in that sector? It's, it's quite an interesting area of uh, discussion, this, uh, that... Uh, you know, when you make the argument look uh, per hectare, we now have the lowest farm payments uh, in Europe because of the, the, the fact that they're averaged across the, the UK and also the UK government's lack of enthusiasm for many areas of, uh, of agriculture and farming support. And of course, on the one hand, people say, oh, well, you know, that'd just be payments to, 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 to big farmers, etc., etc., because as we both know, it actually results in an impetus for the rural economy and one of the best engines of growth in the rural economy is agricultural spending. But there's another difficulty, and it's a very, very serious one indeed at the present moment. There has been outstanding success uh, in terms of uh, the production and the export of Scottish food and drink exports. I mean, the, uh, and, you know, it's not incidentally just because of the outstanding success of the whisky industry. The, the, the increase in other exports is paralleling that fantastic uh, 
that fantastic increase. And that's been a huge success. Uh, uh, they've met, met the target, I think, six years early. I mean, I wish that every government target was met uh, six years uh, six years early. In fact, in the, at the reception the other night, I told them it was totally irresponsible because it meant that every government target would be under such pressure. But it's been a huge success, and all credit to the industry, to the, the new companies, to the entrepreneurs, to the farmers, and, and the, the rural communities for producing such fantastic figures. But, of course, there is developing a supply issue. We're now, in, in terms of... Uh, of uh, <clears throat> certain the quality meat products in Scotland, for example, in a position where demand is exceeding supply. And you may say, well, why on earth do people not uh, uh, furnish more, uh, uh, more supply? Then it goes precisely back to the nature of your question, Rob, uh, that uh, the certain of the supply p patterns of Scottish agriculture and livestock depend, for example, in upland areas supplying the ammunition for finishing for high quality High quality cattle, and unless these upland areas are protected in terms of the farm investment, then these are investments that are di very difficult to make. And of course, if you get a reduction in the in the uh, in the in the weight of, of supply, then it puts pressure on the other ancillary services, uh, uh, the, the slaughtering, the processing plants, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So, we are in the, the food industry. I think as a result of the, the the position where we have the lowest payments per hectare in in Europe now as an explanation of, of a position where we have a demand for, for Scottish uh, uh, quality food and drink products, which in some cases is exceeding our supply. And that's a key question, an absolute critical question that, that we have to address. Uh, I do have a separate point about uh, your announcement in June about a target of doubling to a million acres the area of land to be under local control by 2020. Uh, would that be able to play a part in uh, producing uh, more cattle and sheep? Uh, and how do you expect us to be able to achieve that target six years earlier or not? <laughs> <laughs> that would be next year, Rob. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think the, the, the million acres is a, a, a realistic target. It depends, obviously, on a number of things. There has to be a Scottish land fund, which we've replenished to enable communities. You know, communities have to have the organisation and ability to exercise their preemptive rights, and then they have to be helped and financed to get them into, into that position. There are a number of excellent examples in Scotland where the move to community ownership, whether it be uh, uh, in certain islands in Scotland uh, with the renewable energy projects, uh, certain islands with the, the nature of their produce, or for that matter, of great hopes for Micahannish Air Base in terms of what the, the utility of that facility where community ownership has resulted in a, a rise in production as well as a, a joint ownership of the of the assets, and I'm sure that will be the case as we look to to meet that uh, million acre target. But I do think you know it's quite but it, perhaps not contributing many acres to that target, but nonetheless I think it's quite interesting that in, over the course of this uh, this summer, the, the the lighthouse in the southwest of the mainland of Scotland and the very tip of the mainland of Scotland are both uh, one coming into. Uh, community ownership and one well in the way to being in community ownership, uh, completing uh, that, uh, the great national trail. Uh, and I, I, think that is, uh, I think it will help in terms of inspiring people. But the, co the conference you speak at was very much also about the, the nuts and bolts and the, the inspiration that community ownership can offer to other communities. And of course, finally, our empowerment bill in this legislative programme seeks to extend, perhaps not in terms of number of acres, but in terms of public assets. Uh, some of that ability to the, the urban and city communities in Scotland to, to exercise their ability to empower their communities by community ownership. Thank you. Christina McKelvey, Convener of European External Relations Committee. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. First Minister, you'll, you'll know that um, the, the benefit of the European and External Relations Committee is we get to look out into the rest of the world and see maybe what the rest of the world is thinking when they look back at Scotland. And two big pieces of work that this committee has done in the past wee while and one continuing piece of work is about around European structural funds, ERDF funding. The other piece of work we have done is, is reviewing uh, the Scottish Government's country plans. Now, in both of these piece of, pieces of work, I was wondering if you could tell me how the Scottish Government would um, maximise the use 
of any of the fundings that we can get from, from uh, uh, Europe and whether there's a strategic plan to do that. And the other thing on the country plans, because it ties into the same thing, is how do we develop Scotland's place in the world? And one of the things that we looked at was educational links, cultural links, but specifically business links, and how do we use all of that to encourage uh, Scotland's economic growth, but obviously to encourage Scotland's economic reputation? Well, we, we have a policy of, uh, of maximising the, the best use of, uh, of suitable funds, not, not just in terms of, uh, uh, of the external promotion of Scotland, but, but also in terms of the scientific uh, budgets, research grants, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, I, I think our officials are uh, extremely adept, whether it be in Scottish enterprise or, or, or government officials, uh, in terms of making sure that uh, positive uh, offers from Scotland uh, match the criteria. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, uh, we are looking very closely at the present moment in terms of the changes in the nature of the research and innovation funds uh, in, in Europe, how that marks and can benefit our renewable energy projects uh, uh, in Scotland. Uh, but we have achieved some you know, considerable success uh, in doing that, and uh, the Committee's insight into these things has been important as well. In terms of how we match that to country profiles, then you know the committee, your committee has made very helpful reports. For example, recently on China, uh, in terms of uh, our international engagement, and these these reports are always helpful in, in, in profiling what we're initiatives we're making uh, against the results that uh, uh, that we're achieving, uh, and it's always helpful to get uh, insight into how that can be uh, done better. Uh, I, I just I mean, I think virtually any country that I know of would give their IT for, for two things. Uh, one is the potential international reputation that Scotland has. We have an excellent reputation, and the only requirement is to make sure that that reputation is, uh, is enhanced and, uh, uh, and promoted. And, and secondly, the, the way in which uh, Scottish Development International uh, go about their business. I mean, they're generally regarded as uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, the best possible uh, investment, direct investment and uh, trade organisations in the world. Uh, they're the envy of many, many other countries. And of course, the, the record recently, both in terms of export performance, uh, latest figures last weekend, Scotland the only country in these islands with an increasing export performance. Uh, and inward investment, where we've uh, been enjoying record projects in record years, uh, is a tribute to the, the excellence of their work. Very quick supplementary, President Officer, just on the matter of um, the, the UK Government. Um, and one of the things that we find in the committee is sometimes we're a bit constrained with the fact that we're not a member state and the way that we can look at things. I'm just wondering whether you believe that not being a member state and not having that seat at the top table has any big impact on this and whether if that situation changes, like obviously I hope it does, um, that, that we would maximise and take the, the biggest benefit out of that. I mean, clearly, um, membership state status, whether it's in Europe or whether it's worldwide, can confers certain certain rights. And member states have rights that uh, uh, that devolved uh, administrations don't, uh, both in terms of engagement and terms of engagement for politicians. I mean, I think it'd be accepted that Scotland punches uh, above its uh, status and weight, uh, but clearly, uh, uh, the some of that punching is required because exactly we, we are trying to get to the status of that would be accorded to, a, to either a member state in Europe or alternatively a, 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 and in terms of international engagement a sovereign country by right. So we have to work extremely hard to keep our profile up precisely because we are not a, a sovereign state. Now clearly in European decision making uh, the Council of Ministers trumps all and direct access to the Council of Ministers by right to pursue the policies you want to pursue. There, uh, there is, in terms of European decision-making, no substitute for it. Margot Fraser, Convener of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee will be starting a piece of work uh, in, uh, in a few weeks looking at Scotland's economy after 2014. What, what I think will be very important and helpful to inform that inquiry will be the publication of the Scottish Government's White Paper on, on Independence. Can you tell us, when is that going to be published? Well, I think we're, we're in the autumn now, First Minister. Could you possibly be more mm -hmm. specific, given you well, presumably it, have a date in, your, be in your head? It'll be published before the autumn is over, Murdo. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so you you, and by definition, Murdo, you won't have uh, a long minutes. to wait. But uh, let, let me assure you that uh, when uh, the Deputy First Minister uh, it decides the final uh, publication date this autumn, that then uh, your request and requirements will be absolutely top of the list 
in terms of the considerations she makes. Thank you for that. Maybe I could ask a follow-up about something that might be in the white paper that will be of interest to the committee and to the business community more generally, and that's the question of, of currency in an independent Scotland. Now, I'm sure you'll be familiar with the work of Jim and Margaret Cuthbert, who are economists not unsympathetic to your own political outlook, who published a paper this week saying uh, it would be difficult to see how a UK currency union would be consistent with any meaningful form of independence. And they go on to say it is certainly the case that the constraints involved in such an arrangement are currently unknowable so that the economic policy options open to a Scottish government in a UK currency union are largely a matter of guesswork. How are you going to make sure that your white paper isn't just based on guesswork? <laughs> well, the, uh, I suppose we could cite a, a, a range of uh, experts, uh, some who have not been, uh, not been considered sympathetic to the political direction of the Scottish Government. I'm thinking of John McLaren or Brian Ashcroft, uh, who've uh, argued that, uh, uh, that uh, a currency area with sterling would be a, the sensible option. Uh, other people who have not been great commentators on, on Scottish politics direction, but I'm um, thinking of Professor Danny Blanchflower, who's a, 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 a notable economist of worldwide distinction, uh, would also argue and has argued that position. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, the, the government's own fiscal commission, uh, including two Nobel laureates who've put forward a considered view as to why uh, a shared currency, a, a sterling area, is uh, the best option, not just for Scotland, of course, but for the rest of the UK as well. Uh, and the cent central argument is what discretion does that give you in terms of economic policy making? And, and if you look at the Fiscal Commission report, and uh, I'm sure you shall as an essential part of your preparation for reading the white paper, uh, then you'll look at the list of, uh, uh, of fiscal and economic levers, which is listed in that report uh, in great detail. I mean, areas like competition policy, energy policy, spending, the taxation raising across a range of, uh, of areas which would be under the control of a Scottish administration, which are not under the control of our administration at the present moment, uh, which uh, would still be available to an independent Scottish government within a, a, a sterling area. Uh, now, as a well-known proponent yourself, much to your electoral cost within your own party, if I remember correctly, of, how shall I put it, maximalist uh, fiscal uh, freedom, uh, when you were advocating that position, uh, and unfortunately weren't able to take all of your party with you, uh, then of course you were doing it presumably because you thought that fiscal freedom was an important thing for Scotland to have for a whole range of reasons. Uh, and that would have been done, of course, under your formulation with sterling as a, as a currency. So if you thought it was very important to put forward these fiscal freedoms in terms of your policy perspective, then you must at least have acknowledged the very great importance of these things in terms of the formulation of, of economic policy. So I'm sure they'll find, if we can take the politics aside, Murdo, I'm sure you'll find within that white paper, whether you're now allowed to say it or not, uh, nuggets of which you'll agree with in terms of future economic policy formulation. You'll find there's quite a broad difference between our opinions, uh, even on that matter, <laughs> First Minister. But, but given the time constraints, it would be unfair to pursue this line of questioning much further. But the, I thought it was the difference with Ruth Davidson that was the point on operation. But we'll, 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 leave, uh, we'll leave that to one side. Back to business in hand, Kevin Stewart, uh, convener of Local Government Regeneration Committee. Thank you, President Officer. And I'm glad that the First Minister mentioned community empowerment in his opening remarks is the Local Government Committee has been going round the country uh, for its uh, public sector reform inquiry and now regeneration inquiry. We find that where power lies is extremely important. Uh, COSLA at this moment uh, are looking at their constitutional uh, position uh, for local government. I wonder if the First Minister uh, has a view uh, on the work that COSLA is currently undertaking round about their constitutional position. I'm, I'm very open-minded in some of the areas and proposals that, uh, that, that COSLA have been looking at, and uh, I'm open-minded about the uh, practical entrenchment of local government's uh, position, and, uh, and I think it would be useful, Kevin, if we let COSLA come forward with, the, with their ideas. But we are, we are, you know, over the summer, for example, we have, uh, <clears throat> in a, a variety of uh, announcements in different ways, it reflected on the, the powers that might be available to to local authorities or island councils uh, in Scotland. Uh, when I was in Shetland and the Shetland Declaration, or when I was in the borders talking about Borderlands Initiative, 
uh, and these reflect on the, uh, uh, the powers available. We've been looking closely at what the, uh, uh, the cities have been saying in Scotland. And of course, that comes forward with, uh, uh, with plans what they think would enhance the, uh, the nature of local government in Scotland. Uh, then we'll look at this with, a, with an open mind, uh, as indeed we should. Uh, I would say that certainly the, uh, one of the successes, I, I think, of the, 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 the terms of minority government in Scotland and, uh, was the, that we managed to establish with COSLA a, a mutuality of esteem in terms of the Concordat. Now, I know that the Concordat was, <laughs> you know, became a often a, a matter of, uh, of political debate and discussion, even banter uh, in terms. But there was, uh, I, I believe, something really important underlying that concordat, and that was a partnership working uh, with central government and local government uh, under different uh, uh, political frameworks, uh, which on a, a, a number of issues, uh, and I would point recently, incidentally, to uh, teacher employment uh, figures in Scotland, uh, managed to achieve, uh, I think, substantial progress for people of Scotland under difficult circumstances, let's put it that way. And therefore, I, I'll, I'll certainly look with uh, an open mind at proposals that COSLA make along the, the lines that uh, you're, uh, you're suggesting. You. Very briefly, uh, President Officer, uh, in terms of the mutual respect that has been gained in recent years between uh, this government here and local government in Scotland, um, can we be assured that the level of flexibility and independence uh, that local government now has uh, will not be restricted in future by a, a huge amount of ring fencing which existed before? Well, of course, one of the uh, initial things we did in, in that period of minority government was to, to release uh, uh, local authorities from a, a range of what we felt was unnecessary ring fencing, and that was well received by, uh, uh, by local authorities. There was a temptation in, uh, in parliaments, uh, and not just this parliament, in any parliament, that we see an issue which we care about and we think is really important, and the impatience is that we've got to make sure that's absolutely uh, under our direction and control. Uh, sometimes uh, we have to trust the people delivering uh, these areas of policy and recognise in that parity of esteem that they have as much an interest in terms of delivering a successful outcome for the people as parliamentarians do and, and therefore that was the, the onus behind our release of uh, local authorities from a huge amount of ring fencing back in 2008 uh, and I still think the arguments for that pertain. There are some areas where, of course, where additional funding is given by agreement, it has to be directed because that's, that's, that's of necessity. But nonetheless, uh, I don't think anybody's seriously proposing we move back to the, uh, the extreme ring fencing that we had uh, uh, in previous days. Thank you, President Officer. David Stewart, Convener of Public Petitions Committee. Uh, thank you much, Chair, President Officer. First Minister, you will be well aware, of course, that our petition system has a, a strong history. The previous Scottish Parliament um, had a petition system, and I think it dates back to David II, who also had one in the 14th century. But many of the petitions that we have before us highlight some failures in public services. For example, the failure to roll out diabetic insulin pumps uh, across Scotland. Uh, what can you do in your legislative programme to make sure that health boards deliver uniformly uh, across Scotland uh, on health priorities and that ordinary patients are listened to when they've got genuine health concerns? Well, David, uh, I, uh, I didn't know about David II. <laughs> That's, uh, thank you for that information, and that gives a long honourable tradition. Uh, we certainly look at uh, the work of the Petitions Committee very, very closely indeed, and we take it very, very seriously indeed. Uh, I understand from the the uh, information I've been given that we've received 199 requests for information in relation to 105 separate petitions uh, and that information and the issues that it throws up are treated very seriously uh, by government including the the question you raise of uh, of insulin pumps I mean, to give you an example the uh, during the uh, public discussion uh, meeting uh, the town hall meeting after the uh, uh, the Fraserburgh uh, cabinet uh, last week uh, that one of your petitioners, uh, Ron Beatty, raised uh, the question of safety in uh, school buses uh, and asked uh, uh, for a government debate, which of course is something that can often be facilitated by, uh, uh, by a petitions committee, which uh, you know, I'm very keen on seeing, seeing happen. But uh, it did strike me that uh, in his question and in the answer I was able to give that you know, whether people's 
absolute wishes for progress can always be settled or, or, or met immediately. No one can do that. But nonetheless, there's a great deal of regard and respect for the, the, the position he's been able to pursue through the Petitions Committee, and it gives a, a, a form and a, a, a substance to a request for help. So we, we take these things seriously, and we'll take the point that you've made seriously as well. Thank you. Um, Maureen Watt, the Convener of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, my uh, question is about the legislative programme itself. The Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee is likely to be the lead committee on both the procurement bill, which due to factors out with the government's control, probably because of Europe, that bill has been delayed, and the housing bill um, is likely to be perhaps speedier uh, coming in front of Parliament than might have been expected. So the committee is likely to be considering two fairly major pieces of legislation um, in tandem, and not averse to hard work, of course, but I do worry that the public, and particularly the stakeholders in these two bills, feel that the committee has adequate time to hear all uh, the evidence and, and scrutinise the legislation uh, properly, notwithstanding, of course, that the committee itself might have its own pieces of work that it wants to do. And I wonder if your uh, bill teams consult each other as to when bills are coming forward, even before they come to the PO's office. Well, I, I, I'll certainly look at that. I mean, obviously, the parliamentary timetable is a matter for government in terms of legislation that we propose, but it's a matter for parliament in terms of uh, how that legislation is scrutinised, and I'll certainly look and see if we can be helpful. But I, the, you mentioned the procurement bill, and I assigned it over to the parliament yesterday. Uh, and because it's a parliamentary committee, <laughs> I can maybe say a word or two uh, about it. Uh, the, the, the procurement bill is going to be, you're quite right, Maureen, to say it was delayed by the changes happening in terms of European uh, regulation. Uh, but I'm satisfied, subject to the examination of, uh, of your committee, uh, that we've managed in that procurement bill to, to set down some very key potential enhancements for the way that procurement is used uh, uh, for the Scottish economy and indeed for Scottish society. Uh, for example, the, the small, medium-sized companies. Uh, we already have a good record, third in Europe by most measurements in terms of the number of SMEs who get government procurement, but there are, there are uh, suggestions or an outline in the regulation of the bill how we can make that even better. Secondly, community benefit clauses. A, a critical way in terms of the regulations in that procurement bill of allowing communities to take matters forward. And thirdly, uh, a, an issue which I take very, very seriously and a commitment I gave to the STUC in uh, uh, last April, uh, how we can see procurement as a means of eliminating blacklisting uh, from, uh, well, from society as well as from public sector contracts. And I think with our partners in the STUC, we found uh, a method of doing that to empower uh, the government and the parliament to enable public sector contracts to be used. And that's not just going to be a welcome notification of intent that the Welsh government uh, issued in the last couple of days, but also by regulation uh, within, the, uh, within the bill uh, to enable uh, a clause to be made that if a company is found guilty of blacklisting, uh, then they won't be able to, to qualify for public sector contractual obligations unless they are able to demonstrate that they have mended their ways in terms of how matters are taken forward. So it may be that the delay, which was not uh, in our hands, as you rightly say, has had the benefit with the discussions we have had with stakeholders of producing legislation, which I believe and hope will, will help small and medium-sized businesses in Scotland, will help in community empowerment through uh, public benefit clauses, and help eliminate something which is deeply wrong in society, where people might be blacklisted sometimes unknown to themselves, uh, and using public sector procurement as a means of, of provoking a, a beneficial and welcome change in society. Can you give someone a quick supplementary? Yes, Actually, it was really a follow-on from what Murdo was saying. I mean, uh, the Scottish Government, its agencies are obviously doing a lot of work to raise awareness of Scotland's high-quality goods and services overseas. I'm just wondering, um, you know, what impact the independence debate for or against is having on Scotland's profile uh, overseas? in terms of attracting more investment to Scotland? Well, I think it's having a great effect on Scotland's profile. I remember, uh, if I remember right, it was uh, 
somebody from the Lloyds Bank, uh, Bank of Scotland, came to one of the parliamentary committees. Uh, it was your committee, <laughs> and you're better than I do, but I remember the reference and, and predicted this some, uh, some months ago. And uh, I think, you know, the, well, what can we say? The proof of pudding uh, is in uh, the eating. It's borne out by the figures. I mean, uh, a year past November, I think the Chancellor forecast uh, that uh, inward investment would take a substantial hit uh, in Scotland because of the debate about Scottish independence. And since then, we've seen record levels of inward investment into the, the Scottish economy. But equally pleasing is uh, very substantial progress in, in, in exports as, uh, uh, as well. So the indications are, whether it's for raised profile or for other reasons, or the excellence of the agencies, uh, that there's, uh, I think the raised profile that Scotland is enjoying internationally is being mobilised and utilised uh, uh, to very good effect uh, in business and commerce at the present moment. Uncle McNeil. That, um, that you view the procurement bill uh, as being uh, able to deal with some of our wider social problems um, is something we identified uh, in relation to elderly care and our committee's deep concern that uh, those who have been asked to provide that care arm's length uh, are not treated properly, not trained properly and are paid woefully. Um, do you think then that the, the, the procurement bill as it stands can address some of those issues in terms of providing the living wage not only to those who directly work with us but those who clean government offices, those who look after our elderly care, those people who are suffering those real inequalities distant from the market who are bearing the brunt of the constraints here and there where they are accepting lower pay zero hour contracts, etc. Can you do you believe that, 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 that we can address all of these issues through the procurement bill? Well I, I think we can address some of them, Duncan. Uh, and we've looked at this uh, uh, very closely that, that, that we can have within the regulations uh, 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 areas where uh, uh, and criteria by which we judge the fitness of companies uh, pursuing government uh, contracts. Uh, so I think we can make progress. Uh, but it wouldn't be the case that we, for example, could uh, uh, set a minimum wage in contractors. And the reason for that is that the, the clear direction in terms of the European directives is that they say, well, look, if you want to increase the minimum wage, increase the minimum wage. Uh, and of course, we can't increase the minimum wage. So it would be a, an area where we require the powers to address that directly because we couldn't do it through procurement in itself. That doesn't mean we can't make progress, because as you'll see from the regulations when you and Maureen's committee get the chance to, to study the bill, uh, we have uh, regulations which can be applied to the criteria by which we can judge a, a company. But we could not, for example, prescribe a minimum wage uh, because the, the European Commission perhaps not unreasonably says, uh, or the interpretation of their uh, of their uh, regulations in the matter of procurement are not unreasonably says if a country wants to increase the minimum wage, then it should increase the minimum wage, uh, not try and achieve that by another means. Searching for dealing with some of these mm. issues, I, I accept that. But here and now, uh, that while council leaders and politicians in this place announce a living wage, there are people from those organisations being outsourced to avoid paying the minimum wage or a living wage. What can we do about that now if this, procure this procurement bill is not the way to do it? Well, they, uh, firstly, the state has, has read what I've said about the procurement bill, but we've introduced a living wage in the, in the Scottish Government to, over the Scottish Government's areas of activity, and that, that minimum wage increase. We don't have zero-hour contract in the Scottish Government uh, and our areas of activity, for example. We've, in, we've introduced a minimum wage. That's a, a welcome development in, in, Scotti in, 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 in Scottish society, Duncan. Uh, in the procurement bill, we are going to be able to make progress in a number of areas, not least in blacklisting and in the fitness of companies that, as we assess them. But, you know, uh, the question, I suppose, that uh, the European regulations pose for all of us is one for me as First Minister, but might also be one for you. I mean, that would seem to me to be an excellent reason to, for, uh, for having the ability as a parliament 
uh, if we want to increase the minimum wage to be able to directly increase the minimum wage. Uh, and not, if and you not, don't act now, First Minister, well, then you're unlikely to act when you've got the powers. Uh, all right, I want the First Minister to answer, but we need to okay, move on to the other issue. I'm finished. Uh, since, 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 since we're straight into a, a political debate, so let's, let's just see if we can recap slightly. The action we're taking is very considerable, considerable in terms of what we've done as a government on the living wage. The procurement bill and our substantial discussions with the SDUC is going to achieve uh, progress on a number of areas which are very close to my heart and very close to the heart of the SDUC and all those who care about fairness in Scottish society. We will be able to make progress in terms of procurement within the law in terms of how we ascribe the, the judgment of what uh, suitable companies are. But it doesn't do anyone any favours to pretend uh, in this Parliament we have legislative competence in areas where we don't have legislative competence and therefore uh, it would be useful if people like yourself want to see this Parliament uh, address questions about the minimum wage to also accept as a responsibility <laughs> that we should have the powers to do exactly that. Christine Graham, Convener Justice Committee. Uh, yes, I'm actually going to go back to uh, talk about legislation, and I, these are as authorised by the Justice Committee, and I better stick them. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and uh, also, First Minister, I say I listened that with envy to the fact that you pay keen attention to the Welfare Committee. I hope you pay the same attention to the Justice Committee. Uh, we've got a large number of legislative proposals in train. It's a serious point, which together with your announced legislation on the courts reform and the damages bill, these all make very, very significant changes to the justice system. And they interact with each other because we're practicalities with the closure of sheriff courts, victims and witnesses bill, which will put burdens on police and the crown, rightful burdens, the abolition or the proposed abolition for corroboration, there may be more cases, the end of certain categories of early release, there'll be impacts on the prison uh, system, together with everything else that I've said. So for different reasons, they make all these demands across the spectrum of the justice portfolio. And the concern of the committee was that officials are in silos. Uh, and we wondered if they talk to each other and if there is a strategy for looking not just at the way the legislation technically interacts, but the practicalities that will flow from this legislation. The, uh, well, yes, we, I mean, we, we look very carefully at the, uh, the justice legislation and the practicalities of the floor, and, and uh, I'm sure officials always do that, Christine, because they know that if they didn't, then uh, they would uh, get short shrift by, uh, under your examination and your committee's examination. Uh, we are very conscious that of the number of justice initiatives that are coming forward. We think they are uh, doing good in society. We think the results of the justice system, the, uh, the uh, decline in recorded crime, the best for 40 years, the decline in reoffending, the best for 14 years, indicate that some of the changes we've made uh, are proving very positive. Uh, but we know that changes in justice in particular require close examination. Uh, and we can be absolutely confident that your committee will, will give it exactly that, Christy. Well, I think it wasn't just about whether we do that, because they will, but it's the practicalities that follow from it. But I, I want to just link that to the point that understanding orders, committees are expected to carry out a range of business to hold any government to scrutiny, which isn't just looking at the legislation they bring forward. There should be time for post-legislative scrutiny. Very little is done in this parliament. There should be time to look at petitions. There should be time to do inquiries. Again, speaking on behalf of the Justice Committee, and it happened to previous Justice Committees, there is no room to do anything else. And, it, well, if you were paying close attention, First Minister, to the, <laughs> to the Justice Committee, you'd know that we just do legislation after legislation like a sausage factory. And what I'm asking is if, rather than this, but before legislation is announced, and we know the Bureau allocates, but the Bureau always has a government majority, uh, before business is allocated and before the, the, the government, any government and your government goes forward with something, you speak to conveners so they can do their job, the committees can do their properly, balancing the legislation and inquiries, and therefore, in fact, do the government a, a good service, let alone uh, the Parliament and the people of Scotland. But the balance at the moment, certainly for the Justice Committee, has shifted. Well, the, I understand the point. And also, uh, I remember that at one time, 
relatively recently, there were two justice committees in, in operation, uh, so great were the, the, the demands and legitimate demands on, on, on the committee's time. Christine, we have been forced to choose in terms of justice legislation that's come forward. I mean, we have, for example, a commitment which we intend to honour to bring forward the Cullen uh, recommendations or legislation based on the Cullen recommendations in terms of uh, inquiries and fatal accident inquiries in, in Scotland. Uh, and because we are conscious of the, the pressure of legislative time on your committee and on the Parliament, we, we couldn't put that into the current legislative programme. We will do it, uh, but we are conscious that we have to, we can't achieve all of the legislation that we wish to achieve, particularly if it's bearing down uh, on, uh, on one particular area and, and your committee. So uh, uh, I hope uh, you believe that we, uh, we are conscious of the and grateful for the work that's done in the committee. Uh, and we do and have held over legislation because we're aware that, uh, that uh, regardless of how desirable the legislation is, that all legislation has to be properly and effectively scrutinised. But, uh, Christine, I uh, have enormous confidence in, uh, in uh, your ability to lead the committee in effective scrutiny. I don't take flattery. <laughs> it's just simply a serious point is to look at allowing certain committees, I can only speak for my own, to have time to do post-legislative scrutiny. We have no second chamber. We have no opportunity. The Parliament's 14 years old. It's got a chance, should have a chance to look at how things have worked out. And all I'm saying is governments understand want to announce lots and lots of bills, and that's fine. They've all been like that. But it's to give a committee time to do other things which would enhance its ability to scrutinise current legislation. Wouldn't get in the way of it. I'm, well, in a non-flattering way, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> right, I, I shall take that as a stretcher in the future, Christine, I mean, no more flattering, but uh, I, uh, I uh, we are conscious of the pressure on the Justice Committee. As I said, we've held back, or had to, prioritise a number of justice initiatives. Uh, I am aware that uh, post-legislative scrutiny is a, a key part of our processes in the Parliament, uh, and I'm also aware that, that many justice issues, by their nature, are, are very controversial. Uh, and I know that people care about them uh, a very great deal, and, uh, and, and as they should, because it's one of the integral parts uh, of, uh, of Scottish society. I would say that the evidence thus we have thus far would tend to indicate that some of the legislative uh, initiatives that have made, uh, some of the general government initiatives uh, over the justice portfolio have been pretty successful uh, in terms of delivering good outcomes for the, the people of Scotland and the dramatic dry, uh, reduction in recorded crime. The, uh, well, I particularly welcome the, the welcome indications that reoffending is, uh, is on the decline in Scotland, which would have been one of the perennial issues uh, before this parliament, before committees. The, these are very substantial. The, the move to a a single police service, no doubt not uncontroversial, but a major change, well examined in, uh, in Scottish society. Uh, these are, uh, I, I think, uh, indications that, that, well, let's put it this way, that the legislation uh, may uh, have put great burdens uh, on uh, your committee, uh, but nonetheless, there is a lot of evidence that it's had a, a substantial and beneficial effect for Scotland. Margaret McCulloch, uh, Convener of the Equal Opportunities Committee. Thank you, President Officer. Earlier this year, the Equal Opportunities Committee published its report on women and work. The committee looked in de depth at issues like occupational segregation and training, but also childcare. Yesterday, we learned that women's unemployment in Scotland has gone up by 13,000 on the previous quarter, while total unemployment across the UK seems to be coming down. Why has there been such a dramatic rise in unemployment for women, and why is it so peculiar in Scotland? Well, Margaret, just on that aspect, uh, the way I would look at the recent employment figures is many, many more women are coming back into the workforce. Uh, and the way you should judge that is to look at uh, women's participation in the workforce. I mean, the, the best contrast, actually, is with Scotland and Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland has the lowest level of female unemployment uh, across the United Kingdom, but by some distance, and certainly by a huge distance from Scotland, all, uh, also the lowest level of women in work 
participating in the workforce. Uh, and that's why I would say to you that to look at the participation rate, Scotland has the highest participation rate of women in the workforce. We've got the highest employment rate, employment rate of women in the workforce. And it's not, and obviously we want to see unemployment uh, decline as much as possible. Uh, but uh, the fact that more women are no longer economically inactive in Scotland, but economically active is, is a good thing and an encouraging sign. Now, if we point to where other initiatives, I think, are bearing fruit, uh, I'm very pleased uh, that the, in terms of the percentage of apprenticeships in Scotland, there's been a dramatic increase uh, in the number of women taking part in, in modern apprenticeships. Uh, very significant both in percentage terms and devastatingly significant in numerical terms because when apprenticeships were down at 16,000, the percentage of young women in apprenticeships was very low. Apprenticeships are now at over 25,000 and the percentage of women, not yet 50% incidentally, but nonetheless moved, has moved up very, very considerably, uh, which has led to a dramatic rise in the number of, uh, of young women as, uh, as modern apprenticeships. I still think there are key challenges even within these figures, Margaret. Uh, for example, the Women in Work conference that we held jointly with our stakeholders, including the STUC, identified that in certain apprenticeships, uh, engineering, uh, uh, welding, uh, the numbers of women entering these apprenticeships were still very low indeed. And I think uh, uh, in terms of the efforts we make, we have to, uh, we have to tackle some of the obstacles and barriers uh, that people feel in entering some of these uh, what sometimes have been called reserved uh, uh, occupations. They shouldn't be reserved occupations. They certainly shouldn't be reserved for one gender. Uh, and the government's committing not just to, committed not just to opening up the overall level of female participation in apprenticeships, but also securing advances in that. But I honestly would look at the employment figures uh, for women and not be too discouraged uh, by the trends we're seeing in the, in the workforce at the present moment. I mean, thanks. I appreciate that answer. But why do you think the 13,000 figure shows that unemployment for women has gone up. I mean, I understand for modern apprentices is excellent, but we do have problems with women getting into work. And it is now shown that in the last quarter, we do have 13,000 more women unemployed. Well, as I was saying, that what's happened in terms of female employment has been a sharp decline in inactivity. That's people who are not presenting either for work or for looking for work. Uh, and that is a, that's a good thing. Uh, we have the highest employment rate for women across these islands. We've got more percentage of women in work in Scotland than in England, Wales or Northern Ireland. So it's important in looking at labour market trends. But why do people come out of inactivity into activity? They come out of inactivity because they are encouraged with the view that they might well find employment. Uh, if people think there is no hope, or little prospect of getting employment, then they stay in activity. They're not recorded in the unemployment stats because they're not looking for work. So I think it's important that we look at employment figures in Scotland as being one of the criteria in terms when we assess how, uh, how equal we are becoming as a society in terms of employment. Now, on that, uh, despite the fact we have more women in employment, despite the fact we have more women in employment than England, Wales or Northern Ireland, we still have a substantial issue in terms of the gender gap in male and female participation in the labour market. And that is exactly where uh, I believe that uh, positive developments in childcare provision, but perhaps also transformational developments in childcare, are the key to unlocking that great human resource in Scottish society. If we look at other countries, then the countries with the best provision of childcare, like Iceland, for example, uh, that gap between male and female participation in the workforce, which I think is incidentally the key criteria mark in judging the equality, uh, that gap is 5%. In Scotland, or the UK for that matter, that gap is, is 10%. Uh, and I think that tells us that uh, with the, the right provision, the improvements that are being made now, the transformational improvements that I would like to see, if we proceed in that direction, then I think we can be confident that we can close that gender gap in workforce participation. But in terms of just looking at unemployment rates, I think we're far better, far better having the high level relative to, to other countries in the UK, and certainly compared to Northern Ireland, the high level of female participation in the workforce that we have, yeah, I think is the key figure. And we need to get that onto a par, or at least close that gender gap in employment. 
to get on um, and ask uh, Nigel Dawn uh, to come in at this point. I know that some of the conveners are in the committee, uh, are in the debates at half past two. If you wish to leave now, you've got my permission to do so. Um, Nigel Dawn. Thank you very much. Uh, Sorry, uh, Nigel is the convener of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, and my next reform is to make sure we get shorter titles in the future. Nigel. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Good afternoon, First Minister. I'm conscious, thinking back to the arbitration bill in the previous session, the ongoing work on bankruptcy, and now the conclusion of contracts bill, which will come to my committee. It's all part of a process of reforming Scottish commercial law, and I'm just wondering if you can tell me where that sits in the general scheme of. of reforming Scottish commercial law to ensure that this country is a good place to do business, please? Well, I think uh, your question elicits its own answer. I mean, these points people often regard as, uh, as technical, as, uh, as if they had no impact. In fact, in many ways, the regulatory environment or the ease by which, under Scots law, you can conclude contracts uh, is an absolutely critical part of, uh, of business de decision-making. Uh, now, Scotland has a well-respected body of law, civil and criminal, uh, and uh, has, uh, has uh, institutions which are also uh, highly regarded. These are economic assets for our country, and therefore it behoves us as a parliament uh, to make sure we have uh, uh, bills uh, like the, uh, the contracts bill concluded uh, to enable us to take best opportunity of that uh, reputational asset we have in society. And they're hugely important uh, in terms of how people conduct their business. The, the conclusion of contracts bill under another title came through the Scottish Law Commission uh, system. Uh, clearly, we are now organised, I think, to make uh, better progress with those kind of, of bills. Do you see the Scottish Government actually bringing forward those uh, sooner rather than later? Then may, may I put it that way? Because I think that's what the Scottish Law Commission would, would want to see. This one's been turned around very quickly. Uh, will have been turned around very quickly. I think that was important to them. Is, is that something we, we will be able to carry on doing, do you think? Well, that's uh, an example we should, uh, we should follow. And, and given the ten of the previous questions, hopefully maybe we can get some legislation away from Christine's committee and to your committee. <laughs> Who knows if there's, because there's often a very close boundary between the, uh, some aspects of the, the, the legislation. But, yeah, that turnaround uh, uh, is an important point. They, uh, when, you know, the Law Commission makes recommendations by definition that they, they want to see these recommendations brought into to effect. Uh, and, and, therefore, the example of the conclusion of contracts bill, obviously, is one we'll, we'll try to follow. I thank you, First Minister, very much for giving up your time today to the conveners group. Um, I do believe it's uh, the first of many uh, for the future, so we're looking forward to two and a half hours next time, um, and we'll have a, a lot more time with you. But on behalf of all of the conveners, can I thank you very much for giving up your time and answering the questions so comprehensively. We appreciate it very much indeed. Can I, can I thank all the conveners? Uh, and, uh, and also say that uh, I uh, give you a personal assurance I'll turn up in time on every future occasion that we come forward. <laughs> come back any time.